This video was brought to you by Brilliant, and the first 200 people to sign up using the link below will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. When the Taliban first took over Afghanistan, there was a faint hope that this would be a more moderate Taliban, with more liberal social policies and the political flexibility required to resuscitate Afghanistan's collapsing economy. And to be fair, at the time, they vowed to respect women's rights and keep on the civil service in Kabul. And the few international allies they had seemed to trust them, most notably Pakistan, who justified their relations with the group by insisting that we were looking at a more competent and moderate Taliban than the maniacs of the 90s. So a year on, we want to take a look at how the Taliban are doing, not just in their new policies, but also how they're dealing with Afghanistan's flailing economy, the crippling food crisis, and various anti-Taliban uprisings across the country. Okay, so let's start with their policies. When the Taliban came to power, they made four promises to prove that they'd changed and to endear themselves to the international community. Firstly, they promised to respect women's rights, albeit within the limits of Sharia law. Secondly, they claimed that they wouldn't punish anyone who'd worked in the previous administration or with Western forces. Thirdly, they promised to create an inclusive government, representing non-Taliban ideologies and minorities. And fourthly, they said that they wouldn't tolerate any international terrorist groups who were operating within Afghanistan. And if those were the key promises, it makes sense to go through them one by one, starting with women's rights. Unfortunately, but unsurprisingly, the Taliban haven't really stuck to their word on this one. The first hint of this came in September, when the Taliban banned girls from going to secondary school in certain provinces, citing a lack of teachers and uniforms. At the time, they did promise that all girls would be in school by March, but then U-turned and implemented a complete ban on girls attending secondary schools. A few months later, this was followed by a law requiring women to wear a face veil and limiting how often they could leave their homes. Clearly then, the Taliban haven't kept their word on this issue, although it's worth noting that there have been reports that some members are advocating for giving greater rights to women, if only to help them secure more international aid. So that's women's rights, or lack of them. On to amnesty for officials from the previous administration. While the Taliban have been more restrained than you might expect on this front, for example, they originally kept some civil servants on from the previous administration, there have nonetheless been some pretty horrifying reports of Taliban forces hunting down and even beheading interpreters who had worked for Western forces. There have also been credible reports of public executions, including the execution of various resistance leaders. All in all then, it's not great on this front either. When it comes to an inclusive government, while there were a couple of ethnic minorities included in their original government, including two ethnic Tajiks, one Uzbek, and even one Shia Hazara, there were never any women involved, and it's becoming increasingly clear that the government is essentially controlled by a small group of Taliban elites. The Taliban have even forcibly evicted hundreds of Shia Hazara from the central provinces of Afghanistan, and all of their decisions are apparently being made by the Taliban's conservative elite, with little input from various ministries in Kabul. And to be honest, this is somewhat unsurprising, given that historically the Taliban have preferred to govern via centralized dictatorship, with power mostly invested in a single commander of the faithful. So much for inclusivity then. On to the fourth promise, no international terrorist groups on Afghan soil. Much like with the other promises, the Taliban haven't really stuck to their word on this one either. While the Taliban are fighting a new ISIS variant in Afghanistan, a UN report from May suggests that the Taliban are continuing to provide a safe haven for other international terrorist groups, most notably Al-Qaeda. The Taliban have also defied Pakistan by providing a safe haven to the TTP, otherwise known as the Pakistani Taliban, which seeks to establish a caliphate in Pakistan and has carried out a spate of terrorist attacks in the country to that end. 
Unsurprisingly, this hasn't gone down too well in Islamabad, which assumed that the Taliban would side with Pakistan, given that Pakistani security forces tacitly supported the Taliban during their US occupation. All in all, it looks like the Taliban have reverted back to their old ways, which is pretty much bad news for, well, anyone who's not a militant Islamist. Their unsavory policies have also discouraged foreign donors from providing aid to the government. And that's particularly bad news because Afghanistan is suffering through a crippling economic contraction. Even before the Taliban took over, Afghanistan's economy was struggling. It had a GDP per capita of about $500, making it one of the lowest in the world and only about 1% of the US. In addition, it relied on foreign aid for 40% of its already minimal GDP and 75% of its public spending. Unsurprisingly, the events of the last year have only made things worse. Aid dried up, the Afghani fell 20% against the dollar, and businesses collapsed. In fact, the IMF estimates that Afghanistan's GDP contracted by nearly 40% in the months after the invasion, and 60% of private sector employees lost their jobs. And things weren't exactly great previously. Roughly 50% of the country was living on less than $1.90 a day in 2020. And according to UN estimates from late 2021, that could soon rise to 97%. Just hear that again. 97% of the 40 million or so people in Afghanistan could be living on less than $1.90 a day in the near future, up from 50% in 2020. This economic crisis has caused a terrible food crisis too. It's hard to find reliable data, but reports suggest that food prices have essentially doubled. Inflation and a poor harvest have pushed some 23 million Afghans into a state of acute food insecurity, according to the latest UN data. And a staggering 95% of Afghans aren't getting enough to eat, with that number rising to nearly 100% in female-led households. Now, earlier this year, the UN did launch its largest ever appeal for a single country, hoping for $4.4 billion in emergency aid, but only about a third of that has been raised so far. This is all made more tragic by the fact that the Taliban could actually do something about it. Despite replacing most of the top civil servants with loyal Islamists, the Taliban have proved remarkably effective at fundraising, in large part because they've successfully stamped out a fair bit of administrative corruption. In their most recent budget, they forecast revenues of $2.1 billion for 2022, about the same as Ghani's government raised in 2020. Now, these numbers should be taken with a massive pinch of salt, but even the World Bank estimates that they'll get revenues of $1.7 billion, which would still be a higher percentage of GDP than the previous Western-led administration. And maybe this isn't entirely surprising either. Previously, when they were confined to rural areas, the Taliban had been pretty good at raising money, mainly via agriculture taxation and cross-border taxation on fuel and transit. An ODI report from August estimates that in one province alone, the Taliban have been able to raise $54.3 million. But unfortunately for ordinary Afghans, the Taliban apparently plan on spending between 40 and 50% of this money on their army. This is both because the Taliban are a militia first and a government second, but also because an ISIS affiliate group known as ISK have emerged in the region, and the Taliban are pretty keen on stamping them out. ISK were originally contained in the north of the country, but they've begun staging attacks in more central areas, and even against Afghanistan's Central Asian neighbours, with attacks in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan taking place recently. Ultimately then, while the Taliban has proved surprisingly competent at governing thus far, they're incapable of dealing with both a famine and an Islamist insurgency. So without outside help, the country looks doomed to collapse, creating further instability in an already chaotic region. Now, I imagine that you think you'd be better at running this economy, or at least I hope so. But if you're looking to brush up your maths, computer science, or STEM, then I hope you consider signing up to our sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is an online STEM learning platform where you can learn everything you need to know to better understand the modern world. 
In fact, that's kind of what TLDR is all about too, taking complex subjects that seem scary from the outside and turning them into something more understandable, and in turn, making the world a less daunting place. And understanding STEM better could mean all kinds of things for you. It could help you thrive at work, improve your grades at school, or even just help you learn something exciting and new. No matter what your reason is, taking some time to learn with Brilliant is a whole lot more fun than the boring computer science lectures that I had to take at university. There's no long talks and no textbooks. It's all about interactive experiences that have been put together by experts in their field to help you learn by doing. So if you want to take your next step with STEM and support the channel at the same time, then you can sign up to Brilliant. Then you'll want to use the link in the description. And the first 200 people to do so will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks for supporting the channel.